Welcome back everybody to our studies in constitutional and administrative law. In this video we are going to be spending a little bit more time talking about the nature of constitutional conventions. Now we're going to spend a little bit more time and a few more lessons on this topic, given the fact that we only really took an introduction to the topic in the previous lesson, and so it's important and pertinent for us to really explore this lesson, uh, this topic should I say, a bit more detail in the next few lessons. In this video, we're just going to keep on examining and unpacking some of the ideas that relate to constitutional conventions before giving some examples of what uh, constitutional conventions actually look like. Uh, so a couple of examples of these types of conventions that exist. This is a continuation of our series of lessons talking about the nature of constitutional conventions, the nature of conventions as being a major source of the UK constitution. And it again is something that we touched on briefly in the previous lesson. It is a, an issue that we introduced in the previous lesson. And now it is an issue that we're going to unpack in a lot more detail in this lesson. So when it comes to the idea of a constitutional convention, we will often see a lot of academic debate and discussion around this area of public law. Um, public law is really a breeding ground for a lot of different academic debates, um, for the most part, given the fact that public law is um, an area that intersects with constitutional theory in in a lot more in a lot more ways, which obviously is something that intersects with political theory, uh, the nature of the state, political philosophy, all of which are really really important. And so, for that reason, um, it is not strictly doctrinal. Uh, constitutional law is something that has a lot of uh, theoretical underpinnings, theoretical debates, a lot of political discussions to be had, and so the methodology of constitutional law is not just limited to that of the doctrinal areas of, of law, the, the black letter law, the law itself. And so the result of this is that we have quite a flourishing debate among academics around the idea of constitutional conventions, making delineations, for example, between the different types of constitutional convention. Some have made arguments which pertain to the nature of this uh, view being something of a political constitution. The types of convention have certain characteristics on the basis of the formation and the formulation of the political constitution. According to Taylor, the characteristics of the political constitution are that of foundational convention versus regulatory convention. The result of this is that the foundational convention is the part of the constitution that is regulated um, on the basis of its undemocratic foundations, so things like the royal prerogative, um, things like the House of Lords. Whereas, on the other hand, we have the regulatory element of the constitution, the regulatory conventions of the political constitution, which look to the behaviour of the democratically elected members of government and how to regulate those democratically elected members. So talking about things like the Salisbury Convention, which we'll get to in a second, things like ministerial responsibility, the appointment of ministers, which is also something we'll get to in a second, all of which are conventions which are regulatory in nature. This is one way in which we can conceptualize our understanding of the of the UK constitution, of the way in which the political constitution formulates these two found these two elements, the foundational elements on the one hand, and the regulatory element on the other. So with that being said, um, there are a great many different types of constitutional convention and as we go through various different other topics within constitutional law we will spend time talking about each of these different types of conventions in more detail um here are some notable examples of, of constitutional conventions uh, one such example is the salisbury convention simply put the salisbury convention states that where there is a particular piece of legislation that has been passed by the house of commons and that piece of legislation forms a part of policy um, of the manifesto of the winning political party, then the House of Lords, by convention, does not have the authority to strike down that legislation. Now, legally, it has no more binding authority on the House of Lords than any other piece of legislation. Um, the House of Lords, of course, has to pass laws um, uh, in the same way that the House of Commons does. We've talked about this already. But this does not suggest, therefore, that there is no authority on the part of this convention. The general justification of this convention is the view that there shouldn't be a striking down of the will of the people, which is expressed in their wishes 
um, which is passed by an elected body, um, and this shouldn't be this shouldn't be um, struck down by an unelected body. If the piece of legislation that is being passed forms part of the political party that won the elections manifesto, then the formulation here is that fundamentally people voted, or at least they should have voted for this political party on the basis of that manifesto. So they voted for these different policies. And so the unelected House of Lords shouldn't be seen to be able to strike down legislation which contradicts, um, or, or at, least, at least which is part of, which, which forms part of the winning party's manifesto. That's what the Salisbury Convention tells us. When it comes to the regulation of government activity, there are a whole host of different conventions that exist. One such is the appointment of ministers. Okay, um, it's not There is not necessarily a restriction on the rights of the prime minister to appoint ministers to the role of government. Legally speaking, um, the prime minister could technically appoint whoever they wanted, um, and in fact, um, the reason for this is because there's been the, the the legal development of the relationship between parliament and the government, and the relationship between parliament and the crown is one that has taken place over thousands of years, and so the result of this is. We don't have this sort of foundational moment, such as like in the United States, where there was a revolution and there was the formulation of a constitution which regulated this new government. Instead, it just develops over thousands of years. And so the result of this is that conventions start to develop. So while there is not necessarily any restriction legally on the rights of the prime minister to appoint members of uh, the uh, 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 of of the cabinet to appoint members of the government uh, as into the in, into the position of ministers there is a convention that states that that person will have to be a parliamentarian the result is therefore that the individual has to be a member of parliament now not necessarily an mp but somebody who is a parliamentarian this also includes peers in the house of lords and in fact, historically, the prime minister and members of the House of Lords or members of the government formed part, were, came out of the House of Lords more so than they came out of the House of Commons. It is only with the sort of democratisation of the United Kingdom, the, the, the installation of more and more democratic instruments that has led to this shift in the nature of democracy and this shift in the nature of the role of ministers as they came from the House of Commons rather than the House of Lords. In fact, it's today quite rare for us to have a, a, a minister coming from the House of Lords. So fundamentally, if the Prime Minister seeks to appoint somebody to the role of government, um, they have two choices if they are not already a parliamentarian. They will have to get the party whip to find a, seat, a safe seat constituency for them to be elected as an MP, or they will have to grant that person a peerage so that they're able to sit in the House of Lords. For the most part, the latter tends to happen uh, because it's easier to do. You can uh, The Prime Minister has quite broad discretion to appoint anybody um, to uh, become peers in the House of Lords. A very recent example of this you can see is the example of the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who is the Prime Minister at the time of recording in uh, in March 2024, appointing David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, as Foreign Secretary. David Cameron uh, was not a member of Parliament at the time at the point at which he was appointed uh, at the point at which he was appointed Foreign Secretary. The result was that he had to be given a peerage, and so he now sits in the House of Lords as Lord Cameron. And so the result is that he is now able to sit on the cabinet as the foreign secretary finally then uh, and another convention which regulates the relationship between ministers let's think about ministerial collective responsibility fundamentally it is another uh, convention so there's not legal enforcement we'll talk about enforcement in the next lesson but fundamentally the principle of collective responsibility tells us that the cabinet by convention ought to represent a united front this in this regard, what tends to happen is where there are disagreements in cabinet about the nature of policy or the direction of policy or the implementation of different laws, where those disagreements exist, those disagreements have to be resolved in cabinet behind closed doors. If there is not a resolution uh, among the different ministers of state in relation to a particular piece of policy, then the aggrieved minister who has some kind of problem with the policy has two options. They will either have to publicly support the measure or policy, so they have to present a united front, there is a unanimity in terms of agreement, or they will have to resign in order to be able to critique it. 
we've seen this happen in uh, multiple different points in, in history. There have been members of um, the cabinet who have resigned in response to the direction of policy in order for them to be able to actually critique that direction of policy. There has also been examples where they have publicly supported a measure and then subsequent years have come past and then maybe in their in their biographies or whatever um, or their autobiographies um, they have uh, they have stated that they actually publicly didn't or they, they privately didn't support the measure but publicly had to support it because of this idea of collective ministerial responsibility.